Okay, so now we're getting into some of the things where I, I am uh, an expert in, and that being biology. Um, so we're going to talk about the basic needs of living things. I'm going to tell you about a living thing that I have done research on, which is the bowhead whale, and some of its basic needs. So the bowhead whale uh, belongs to a group of other whales that have baleen in their mouth instead of teeth. The, ba the bowhead whale itself is associated with sea ice and lives in northern waters, the Arctic Ocean, um, in Greenland, Canada, and Russia and Alaska. It depends on uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton, which grow in the upper level of these Arctic waters, um, which flourish during the summer months when there is 24 hours of sun. They are also an important people, sorry, an important um, resource for the indigenous people of Alaska, Canada, and uh, Greenland and Russia. Um, so this whale is hunted for its um, blubber and meat and uh, products are used by the indigenous people and help them to survive long cold winters. Their blubber, of course, is energy rich um, and they are very large. So one whale can provide food for many, many, many months for a lot of people. So these, um, uh, these indigenous people hunt the whale. So it's important. Um, its well-being, of course, is important to the people that live there. Um, many scientific studies have been done on this whale, uh, including figuring out its movement patterns, its population size, um, whether it's growing or declining, and how humans may be affecting that. Um, so this is a piece of baleen, one piece of baleen in a larger whale, which you can see is very, very large. These are very, very large whales. Um, and this is a, a tissue in an ovary of a whale. Um, which has been done in some science, used in scientific research. So this whale is important to, um, for many different reasons, um, but its biology has been studied to help um, understand about the environment, to understand uh, its impacts in uh, indigenous people's culture, um, and it is also an endangered whale at one point. It still is on the endangered species list, although some populations seem to be doing just fine. All right, so living things. How do we study them is what this is going to be all about. Now, life occurs on many different levels. And so when talking about biology or, or how things live, you need to first um, identify at what level you are studying it. So the very basic component of life, you have cells. Now you can go even further down from there. Of course, you can talk about the proteins and the pro uh, and the little things that make up cells, but that's where we're going to start for the purpose of this class. Cells combine to make tissues. Okay, tissues of are made of cells which have a similar um, function in the body. Tissues group together, different tissues to make organs. Organs uh, work together to make up a system. So you have a circulatory system in, ch in charge of moving blood through the body. Respiratory system in charge of, of breathing. Systems work together to make an organism. And then organisms, a group of them together that are the same species which interact, um, are called a population. A group of populations of a bunch of different species, like this panda bear and these trees and you know the insects that live there, is called a community. When you study a community of organisms and the um, non-living things within that uh, community or within that area, that's called ecology um, and ecology studies ecosystems. So again, fundamental to um, biological life is um, are the, the things which make up cells, including compounds. Now you can have organic compounds, which are compounds made of six key elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. sulfur. Um, and you can also have inorganic co compounds, which are not important for life. 
they don't contain carbon hydrogen or carbon oxygen bonds so some inorganic molecules include plastics organic compounds include uh, sugar molecules which we use for energy there are natural organic compounds and synthetic organic compounds which are made by humans now again an ecosystem is um, studying the abiotic or non-living things and their interaction with living things which can be very complex um, one of the areas within an ecosystem which is um, of major important includes the transitional area called an ecotone generally it's very diverse okay so wetlands have a lot of this ecotone area where it's a transition between two other ecosystems such as a forest and an aquatic ecosystem landscapes then are a cluster of interacting ecosystems say in a mountain valley or mountain top then biomes are large areas of the earth which have a similar vegetation and climate so a desert is a biome we live in an eastern deciduous forest all of them combined make what we live in the earth the biosphere so again ecology studies the interactions between living things and their environment including the processes and the way nutrients flow um, in and out of, of an ecosystem a species is an organism that shares common characters and different there's different ways to define a species you can define them as interbreeding individuals with within populations or you can divide, and that would be the biological species concept, or you can define them by similarities in genetics by looking at their DNA. Now, the ability to tell one species uh, apart from another is part of the uh, science of taxonomy, naming and classifying organisms. Um, Carol Linnaeus was the first, um, or a modern kind, the first. I guess the pioneer of taxonomy, father of taxonomy, and he began naming and classifying many different organisms and came up with this hierarchy of naming organisms, which is um, you can group them according to kingdom, phylum, class, order, and family, genus, species. And you can see that here with these uh, different um, uh, animals. They're all in the kingdom Animalia. Um, sea stars do not have a backbone so they are not in the phylum chordata okay um, snakes are not mammals so they are not in the class mammalia um, let's see squirrels are not carnivores so they are not included in the order carnivora uh, bears belong to the family ursidae and polar bears and black bears belong to the genus ursus and then the polar bear is Ursus arctos. Okay, so kingdom, family, class, uh, sorry, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. An example of a species that we saw before was the bowhead whale. The species name was Baleina mysticetus. And it would fall uh, within the same animal, uh, kingdom, phylum, class, as the polar bear, but it belongs to a different order. All right, environmental factors include conditions um, that vary in space and time, but are not used to up or made available to other species. Uh, wind, rain, salinity of fire then are conditions in an environment. Resources then are factors that are consumed by organisms and can be biotic or abiotic. So you could um, drink the water or you could eat uh, and the grass conditions and resources then are essential for survival of organisms now all organisms have an optimum range for their conditions in which and resources in which they can survive and in which they can grow and reproduce the greatest okay you can see that in this graph so looking at temperature here there's an uh, optimal range in which, if everything else is left the same, this uh, bamboo can grow. Uh, extending from that, there is a range of tolerance. So if you decrease or increase the temperature, this plant can still grow, just not as well. And then, then finally, there is a limit of the tolerance 
a point at which if it is any hotter or any colder, it cannot grow. Okay, so the zone of stress then um, is after that point, after that limit of tolerance. It can no longer grow or survive. Every organism has all of these, um, has a specific range in which it w has an optimum, um, in which it can survive, in which it cannot survive. So um, there are many different factors, of course, which are going to affect the uh, an organism's ability to survive and grow at an optimum or at below an optimum. Um, but there is one in which it will limit its growth. That will be the, the limiting factor. Okay, so the law of limiting factors is that any factors outside the optimal range will cause stress and limit that growth, re reproduction, or survive, survival. Some of them can have synergistic effects where two can have an effect together that they would not have individually. So, for example, let's say you have this tree, you give it pr uh, plenty of sunlight and plenty of water and it grows, right? The, and the limiting, and it has plenty and it, and, and it can't, and these are within the optimum range. But uh, through experimental studies, you, saw, you find that nitrogen is limiting its growth. And that if you add nitrogen through fertilizer, you can increase its growth. Okay, so then you would say the nitrogen is the limiting factor in the growth of this tree. All right, so there are other environmental factors which affect the health of living things, including the habitat, which is the place in which it lives and can survive and reproduce and help, um, help its young um, also survive and reproduce. And the habitat and the resources that a organism uses then is called its niche, okay? Uh, the competitive exclusion principle is that no two species can have the same niche in the same place and same time. And that is because if they do, eventually, through natural selection, one will outcompete the other and replace the other. So, for example, uh, an owl and a copperhead snake may live in the same environment, but, and they may even eat the same thing. Uh, they both eat small mammals, but the way that they get them is different um, and they live, uh, this one lives in the trees, this one lives on the ground, so they do not have the exact same niche, so they can live in the same environment. Alright, we have four spheres then uh, which we can classify these resources into generally, um, and they are the biosphere, which is within living organisms and we change or have the ability to um, break down, transfer, move around, use chemical reactions um, within our bodies to affect these other four. The atmosphere is the gases separating Earth from outer space. The hydrosphere is water within the Earth. And the lithosphere is the Earth's crust. And all of these interact uh, in some po some point. All right, the atmosphere is mostly made of nitrogen and oxygen and has some carbon dioxide in it, but nitrogen is about 70%, oxygen is about 21%, and carbon dioxide is really low, but those are three most abundant, or uh, oxygen and nitrogen are the most abundant. Plants and animals need oxygen for respiration and plants need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Um, other nitrogen fixing bacteria need nitrogen for, um, or actually make nitrogen available for living things. Okay, so the process for photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide and water uses sunlight to make sugars. And those sugars then are important for energy uh, in respiration. Oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis, which is not needed, but oxygen is needed in respiration. So in respiration, you take that oxygen and glucose, you break glucose down into smaller and smaller pieces until it becomes carbon dioxide. As you break it down, 
it releases energy and you use that energy for growth, maintenance, repair, and some of it is lost as heat. And then water is a byproduct product of that. All right, the hydrosphere then is the source of hydrogen and um, water. Vaporization is evaporation, the changing of water from its liquid to gaseous state. Uh, and sublimation is evaporation of ice, so it's going from solid to um, gas. Um, both require energy, which is how we take advantage of the cooling effects of sweating. Ice is also less dense than water, which is uh, not normally true when you go from a liquid to a solid form. But this is important for uh, aquatic organisms. If ice was more dense, then it would sink to the bottom and it would cause all the things on the bottom of the um, lake or pond or ocean to die. All right, the lithosphere then is the crust, the Earth's crust, the outer layer of physical, um, generally dirt, soil, sand, silt, and clay. Um, and within there you have minerals. Minerals are required for human and biological life, including calcium, iron, potassium, phosphor, and sodium, and a bunch of other ones. Um, they're sources in the lithosphere. Now, these are not static. Like I said, they interact between each other. Minerals dissolve in water and are made available for living organisms within the water. Air, um, water evaporates into the air. Water runs over the lithosphere. The lithosphere, um, uh, the lithosphere is uh, washed away or eroded by water. And so the interaction between the three allows for the exchange of all three within them. Um, air will also be dissolved into the water and that's how fish and other aquatic animals breathe through their gills as they pull that oxygen which has been dissolved in the water out through their gills all right so the simple elements are taken from spheres and synthesized into complex organic compounds by living things um, and that's why we have complex tissues all right so that's the interacting spheres now we're going to switch to energy there's different types of energy, including the which is the ability to move matter. Kinetic energy is the energy in motion, and potential energy is stored energy. Chemical energy is potential energy stored in chemical bonds. So here we have potential energy of um, with this ball at the top of this um, wedge. Okay? It has potential energy because we lifted it up there. Um, and it has stored energy. Gravity um, pulls the ball down and as it's moving then it releases that energy and that energy in action or motion is then called kinetic energy. Now the things we eat have chemical energy such as that sugar and when we break that sugar down um, those bonds which hold those sugars together release energy um, and we measure that in a measurement called a calorie or the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree of celsius okay so that's a, a measurement of energy chemical energy and we usually refer to calories in the food that we eat All right, energy is very important for our environment. We um, capture energy through multiple processes. Um, we store energy in batteries as potential energy there, or firewood has potential energy when we burn it, that's kinetic energy. Um, we put gasoline in our cars. When we burn that gasoline, we're releasing chemical energy. Um, so, this is a good diagram showing all the different parts of energy. All right, energy in living things in photosynthesis, we, um, plants and photosynthetic organisms capture energy from light and use that energy to make organic compounds. In respiration, mentioned before, we break down that energy and use it for growth and reproduction. 
producers then, primary producers, are organisms that can use photosynthesis. So they're at the bottom of our, our food chains. Uh, consumers then consume those products and so we have primary consumers which are vegetarians or herbivores, secondary consumers which eat primary consumers and so on and so forth. Now all consumers and producers require respiration. So even plants, plants use photosynthesis to make sugars but then they also have to break down those sugars in respiration um, to use that energy. All right, finally, all these um, elements and processes um, and nutrients need to cycle through um, the environment and are used and recycled um, multiple times. So we have biogeochemical cycles which cycle compounds involved in processes of biology, geology, and chemistry. Now, as far as living things go, we want to make them available for um, cellular processes. So three that are very important for biology are the carbon cycle, okay, um, and that's important because photosynthesis captures carbon, and like I said before, respiration then releases that carbon back into the atmosphere. Nitrogen is very important because it's a very basic element which is a limiting factor for the growth of many plants. So the cycling of nitrogen is very important. And finally, phosphorus as well, similar to nitrogen. We're not going to go through those, at least not in this lecture. All right, so that then is a kind of a, a crash course in the fundamentals of biology, the elements required for life.